<laughs> you know what's not happening? My animations are not working. They worked yesterday. Hmm, this could be a problem, guys. <laughs> Let's see. Does anybody know? All right. Norval, when we practiced this yesterday, I think I did the slideshow in the here, right? Or was it something in GoToMeeting? Uh, I think we did it. I think we just did it using slideshow, and I I don't remember there being any issue. I wonder what's going on. I don't know. How exciting, huh? Well, let's let's see. What's the probability of that happening? Um, okay. Let's see. And I am hitting like the down button or the enter button, and it should be going. Maybe there's a delay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can we start on the next slide? Okay. Let's see. Ah, okay. Whatever. It it's going. Now everybody sees that Benford's law and Simpson's paradox has jumped up. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm wonderful. Okay. Don't know. Um, so anyway, getting back to <laughs> my thing. So that how to detect data fraud? We use something called Benford's law, and the other is how to reconcile conflicting conclusions is um, Simpson's paradox. And so these are two of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so on here. Okay, so quick bio, uh, who I am. I am uh, Mary McShane Vaughn. I'm the principal at University Training Partners, and what that company does is we design and develop Lean Six Sigma training. We deliver it directly to corporations. We also do uh, uh, classes through continuing education departments at, at universities. I've got a PhD in industrial engineering statistics from Georgia Tech, and uh, used to be a, a tenure professor at Southern Poly that turned into Kennesaw State University due to some reorganization at the state of Georgia. And I've got uh, I'm a black belt quality engineer and reliability engineer from ASQ, and I was the black belt exam chair, which was a really cool job of you know making sure that those you know certification exams were were developed correctly and you know. Uh, fit the body of knowledge and all that, and that was for a two-year stint. I am a member, actually, of the Savannah section, uh, 1519. I used to be one of the colleagues of, of Norval. Norval was uh, chair of our section back a few years ago when he was down in the Savannah area. And um, I have a new book out called The Probability Handbook. See how all this ties in, right? Uh, from ASQ Quality Press, and that came out probably in February. Uh, people seem to like it, you know, for what it is. It, it seems to be a, a pretty good book, and I am working on the probability workbook right now, and that's going to be a companion. So the handbook tells you, you know, all about the distributions and probability and that kind of thing, and then the workbook is going to be practice problems with detailed solutions. So that should be due out in December. Uh, we're certainly hoping that we can get that done then. So Susan has said that there is no sound. Is that true? Uh, we can hear you on our end. OK, OK, I just wanted to make sure. All right. This is why we practice, I guess. OK, um, well, the first topic we're going to talk about is you know, how to detect fraudulent data. So let's think about uh, reporting areas of various countries. So. What we have here is two data sets, data set A and data set B, and they're reported in kilometers squared, the area, so I don't have a real good feel for square kilometers in my head. Um, but you look at this data and you have to say, okay, well, one of these columns is the real data and the other one is fake data, okay? So which might be which? So, you know, look at that, depending on what you know about uh, Afghanistan and Azerbaijan and all that, just go ahead in the chat box and I'll, I'll do a quick tally of which data set do you think is the real data set? So 
go ahead and type in either A or B in the chat box. First one, so Chuck is an A. Okay, we've got a B. That was, I guess, the three of you guys, right? <laughs> okay, we've got another B. Got a B. Looks like B is winning here. Interesting. Okay, does everybody have a chance to kind of put in their vote? If not, go ahead and quick give me one. All right, and remember what you, you said, because we're actually going to be using Benford's Law to determine which one of these data sets is real and which one is fake. Okay. Sounds like somebody uh, <laughs> has something going on. Um, how do I mute? Uh, in the attendee list, there's a okay. mute call button. Okay. Yeah, I don't know who, who that is. <laughs> Not sure. Um, ah, okay. Now it's better. <laughs> okay, so, you know, where could we encounter some fake data, right? So you think about all the different data we look at, How, where would it be fake? So some examples would be filling in data gaps for inspection records or production counts. Let's say you don't have some data and you want to try to you know, some uh, unscrupulous person wanting to you know, fill that in or adding extra expense claims to, your, to someone's tax returns. Uh, of course, we would never do this, but this is the kind of things that they have to find um, whether data is fake or not. Creating false revenue figures, uh, you know, Bernie Madoff did that, Enron did that. Falsifying lab data or submitting false insurance claims. So these are all the kinds of instances where uh, people will go in and try to figure out if the data they're looking at is in fact real or if it has been faked. Okay? So you think about a strategy. If, if we were a cheater, okay, if we're going to fake data and make it seem random or you know, okay, you know, what would be a cheater's strategy? You know, if you want this data to be in there and you want it to look random-ish, um, what kinds of things do you think you might do? If you have an, a, an idea, just go ahead and type it in the chat box. Okay, so we've got to generate some data. What, what are some ideas that we could do if we were a cheater that wanted to not get caught? Ah, random number generator. Yeah, that's a good thing, right? We can even go ahead and uh, use that uh, a random number generator in Excel, right, and get something. And that way it'll kind of look... Uh, uniform, right? So there won't be any red flags out there. That's a you know a really good idea that a cheater might have. That oh, you know what? I'm going to use uh, a random ge number generator to make this definitely look random. All right. So that's a, a great uh, a great thing here that a cheater would do. And so what he would do is his his fake data would follow what a uniform distribution. That's what a random generator is based off of, so that uh, let's just look at the leading digits of the data that we're making up. So the very first digit of uh, the revenue data, or the very first digit of the production counts, the first data, or the first uh, digit of um, you know defect counts, whatever it is, right? So that leading digit, that first digit, okay, each digit from one to nine would have the same chance of being chosen, right? So it's like around 11%, right? So we would see, um, you know, 11% of the, the made up data would have a leading digit of one and the other ones two, three, four, and that kind of thing. So we, we think, or the cheater would think that, that it could just slip that data in there and nobody would know, right? Well, luckily, um, this is really not the case. Data doesn't follow a, uni a lot of data doesn't follow a un uniform distribution. So let me um, go ahead and give you this. Now, if you're uh, an older engineer like I am, uh, you know, 
when I was my first job out of college, you know, I worked with engineers, and some of the older engineers had logarithm logarithm uh, books, right? They would have just little paperback copies, stick it in their pocket, and they'd carry around their their log tables. And uh, this is, you know, if you didn't have a calculator or whatever, way back when. So we're talking about 70s and 80s if we're all you young folks. So, you know, what you would do is you'd get a number and then you could look up the logarithm tables. All right. Well, way back in 1881, a guy named Simon Newcomb dis discovered that, you know, in all these log tables, the pages where the leading digit was a 1 were much more worn out, written on, and dirty than the others. Okay. He wrote a paper about it. It wasn't uh, really picked up. It didn't get a lot of attention. But Frank Benford, who was a scientist at GE, observed the same phenomenon about the log tables and published a paper about it in 1938. Okay. It got a lot of attention, uh, mostly because it was right after a physics paper that was uh, later became famous. So <laughs> it was a, a, a very special issue, so everybody read uh, Frank's paper as well, and so now all of a sudden we are talking about Benford's law. And let me tell you what he uh, he observed here. Okay, Benford's law for leading digits. So that's the first number. Right? Is we've got a discrete probability distribution. So the probability of a particular leading digit d is equal to log base ten of one plus one over d, and so d equals you know, one, two, three, all the way up to nine, we don't have a leading digit of zero because that wouldn't be a significant leading digit. Okay? So looking at that, this is what the probability distribution looks like. So it's definitely not uniform. Well, Benford looked, he looked at thousands and thousands of data sets, areas of rivers, areas of countries, uh, scientific um, uh, constants, all sorts of things, and he kept seeing the same phenomenon with the leading digits. So it looks like here, right, the number one is um, occurs about 30% of the time, and then as we go on with uh, a successive leading digits, the probability of that occurring goes down, right? So um, a three is going to show up more than a four, is going to show up more than a five, and so on, right? So we can really exploit this this probability distribution to, to catch people who are, you know, falsifying data. So let me compare here the comparison of the Benford distribution, which is in blue and will be throughout the presentation, and the uniform distribution that we had said, oh, you know, if we use a random number generator, we could probably uh, do this. So you can see that there's, you know, if you use a uniform distribution, what you're going to do is you're going to really under um, predict or uh, undercount the one the data that should be starting with one, right? And you won't have enough twos. Three, four, okay, and then you're going to have too many numbers that start with five, six, seven, eight, and certainly nine, right? So we can compare the leading digits of our data set to what we would expect based on the Benford distribution to detect fraud. So I think that's a really cool thing. All right, so getting back to um, our areas of countries, knowing what you know now about Benford distribution, can you kind of look at those two data sets and tell me which one you think is real? Is it A or B? Okay. Okay, so now it seems like the opinion has turned and we now have data set A. That's because we see that there's a lot of areas that begin with one, and you know, a couple will start with uh, eight, nothing starts with a nine. If you look at over in data set B, we have a lot that start with nine, right? So let me um, show you the graphs of these. Here is the frequency of leading digits for data set A. Benford is in blue, and data A is in green, and you can see that yeah, that data set really does follow um, a Benford distribution. So that is actually the, the true area. And then data set B, you see, there's absolutely no areas that even had a one, right? So it's screaming at us that something is wrong. And then look at all of the um, 
the areas in that data set that had uh, a nine, and you know, Benford was predicting uh, around one, right, based on that. So this is how we can do this, how it works, right? So you notice that we've got a, uh, a p-value here for data set A, and that p-value is 0 0.74. And so what is the hypothesis associated with that? Well, what we're doing is it's, it's just a goodness of fit hypothesis, really. So I've got, let's see if I can write here. I'm trying to use my pen here. And it is not working. Let's see. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, well, I'll just tell you. The null hypothesis is that the data follows a Benford distribution. The alternative hypothesis, H1, is that it does not follow a Benford distribution. So it's, this is called a partial negative uh, hypothesis because we can't prove that something follows a Benford. We're only looking to see if it doesn't follow a Benford, right? So we want a, p, a large p-value. So you can see data A has uh, a p-value of 0.74 which means that, hey, you know, there, we really don't have any cause to, to worry about it. It looks like we're okay, but data B is, is screaming at us, right, that we've got uh, a p-value of 0.03, so it definitely does not follow a Benford distribution, and we've got a little bit of a problem, right? So how I did this is, hold on a second. I used... a chi-square distribution, right? So I calculated the observed minus the expected square of that divided by the expected, um, expected based on uh, Benford, and I came up with a, a total chi-square. And I compared that to a chi-square distribution with eight degrees of freedom. And so that's how I came up with those p-values. So it's a pretty straightforward goodness of fit test. Okay. All right. Now, um, there's... Benford is also used in something called forensic accounting. So uh, Dr. Negrini, I think he's at uh, West Virginia now, came out with um, a paper in the 90s where the Brooklyn, New York tax fraud investigators actually used Benford's law to catch uh, people who were actually embezzling uh, from the country, uh, company and performing tax fraud. So you can see that you know, out of the 103 uh, samples, we have the Benford's Law prediction in terms of the percent that would fall, uh, the percent of the first digits, and then they went and got true uh, IRS tax data and did those percentage for the first digits, and then the fraudulent data, which they didn't know was fraudulent at first, but uh, it turns out that it was. So let me show you what that looked like. Okay, So true tax data from the IRS, uh, and I think this was on... Um, uh, interest payments or, or, or something like that. It was a particular metric. Boy, does it follow a Benford's distribution, right? The p-value is extremely high, which means that we don't really have any cause to reject. And the IRS uh, tax data certainly follows a, uh, a Benford's law. So we would expect that any new tax data we have also follow Benford's law. So when we look at this. Here is the first digit frequencies for the fraudulent data. And you can see that they didn't have any uh, data that began with one, hardly any with two, none with three. Uh, they must have had a sale on fives, you know, because, you know, <laughs> more than 60% of the fraudulent data started with the digit of five. So again, p-value is uh, 0.00, you know, it's a slam dunk case, and they went ahead and and looked at the books and, you know, prosecuted a whole bunch of people. So, you know, this is used, uh, to, to great effect. Okay. Another example is um, the Bernie Madoff returns where he was doctoring the books and saying, oh yeah, this is the, the return that you're getting on your investment. And they looked at 214 records for those returns and they can see too that he actually, um, it looks like he tried to follow a Benford law, but he had way too many uh, digits that began with one. Right, almost 40%, and so that p-value was a 0.03. Kind of interesting. Right. So there's some interesting features about this law. Now it's called Benford's law. It's also called the the first digit law. 
uh, there's an extension, and Tim Hill wrote a, a good paper about the extension, but it, we don't even have to look at just first digits. Okay? You can test the frequency of the second digit of data or the first and second digits together. Right? So what's the probability of uh, a number starting with 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 3, and so on, or just the third digit or the first three digits. So there's a whole class of probability distributions to look at you know, the first digit, the first two digits, the first three digits, and so on. So, you know, they're all kind of based on the same probability uh, distribution that I, I gave you, but with a little bit of changes. So that's kind of interesting, right? Another thing about ben Benford's Law is, and it, it, it kind of makes sense, that if Benford's Law would hold up for data, say, measured in square kilometers, if we change the scale of the data, so now instead of square kilometers, we're doing square miles, that Benford's Law relationship really won't change. We still should see where the majority of um, the, the numbers begin with 1, 2, and, and go on. So that same shape, that's what we would expect to see. So that's kind of nice. So it doesn't really matter if we're measuring money in dollars, pesos, or euros. We should still kind of see that, that shape. All right? Another thing about uh, Benford's Law is actually log invariant. So we took log 10, but we could also look at data and take a log base 16, right? And that really won't affect the shape of the distribution. It's still the same idea. Uh, of course, in, in log 16, we would have numbers from one, leading digits from one all the way up to 15, but you would still see that same phenomenon where one is the most and then it goes down from there. Okay? So it's kind of a, a cool little mathematical things about Bedford's Law. So let me, uh, kind of show you what I'm talking about when I say scale and variance, we'll go back to our area example. And remember, we've got this, the frequency of leading digits for, for data set A, and remember that was in kilometers squared, and so we've got that, but now I, I went ahead and I converted it to square miles, and you can see that the same, we've got basically the same shape. As a matter of fact, the p-value for square miles is a little bit better, it's a lot better. 0.94 versus 0.74, right? So both of these are still following a Benford distribution. Right. Now, does Benford always apply? No, uh, but if your numbers vary over several orders of magnitude, then they will tend to follow Benford's first digit law. Okay, so we're talking about areas, areas of countries, areas of rivers, areas of the ice sheets in, in our Antarctica. Uh, we've got tax data, investment returns, population counts, or stock prices. Okay? They would follow Benford's law. Okay? Now, if your data, um, you know, th those numbers vary within a very narrow range, then they wouldn't follow Benford's law because they wouldn't have enough room to vary. So if we're talking about, say, heights of men, you know, heights of men follow a, a normal distribution with a, a mean of around 69 inches and a standard deviation of 2.8. So there's not really that much wiggle room, right? So we're not going to see Benford's law manifest itself. The number of airline crashes per year, uh, luckily, right, we don't have um, that many, so the numbers are going to be pretty small and not very variable. So that wouldn't be a good um, application of Benford's Law, but other things would. And it comes up a lot more often than you can think. Uh, and you can always just go ahead and do a, a quick little chi-square test to see if the data you're looking at follows Benford's Law. If you know that data is true, you say, okay, it follows Benford's Law, then any other data I get, right, based on the same metric, should also follow Benford's Law. And if it doesn't, then I know something is, is awry. Okay? So, that's what we have there. All right. Now, does anybody do any data data quality kind of work? Does anybody think that they might have a reason to maybe implement Benford's Law? Yeah, maybe in your auditing functions. Yeah, it's good to know about. It. It's it's kind of an interesting thing. It uh, it seems counterintuitive, but um, I think it's very useful. All right. So that is our first classic probability problem.
The second one is Simpson's paradox. Okay, so let's uh, kind of change hats here and imagine that we are quality managers and we've got some sort of quality alert on our dashboard report. Okay, and obviously it looks like shift two, right, based on our, our defectives, percent defectives, has a big problem, right? Shift one only has a 2% defective rate, and then all of a sudden shift two shoots up to 20.6%. That is a huge problem. What are we going to do? So we've got to investigate and figure out exactly what is going on in shift two, right? All right. Now, we get other data here, and this data happens to be uh, split out by supplier, the raw material supplier. So here's our data set, and you can see here that, well, wait a minute. I thought that there was a, a big defective problem, and here my percent defective is only 1.3. What's going on, right? Then I look at the raw material table for supplier two here, and this has me even more confused because, well, you know, before all the defects were on shift two, and now it looks like shift one and shift two are bad. Like, what in the world is going on? So I've got, you know, apples, oranges, and bananas in terms of, you know, whatever data table I look at, I have a completely different story. Now, did somebody make a, a mistake with the data? No. All this data is correct and it's consistent. Um, so what seems to be going on? Okay. Well, let's compare these analyses. Okay. So here's the, the table, and we call this the summary or aggregated table, where we have shift one and shift two. That's clearly showing that we've got a big defective problem on shift two. And then we've got the table for supplier one, and we've got the table for raw material supplier two. And you can see that, oh gosh, um, all three are telling us a different story, but notice about, you know, here's the material supplier one. Notice that most of the supplier one material was used on shift one, right? And then I look at material two here, and I see that most of the raw material from supplier two was used on shift two. We can say that really shift and supplier are, are confounded in this case, right? All right, so what has happened here, because we're getting three different answers, we've run into something called Simpson's paradox. So let me explain what the paradox is really saying to us. It's a situation in which conclusions, the conclusions we draw when the data are presented in separate groups, just like the ones that we have for uh, supplier one and supplier two, those conclusions reverse when the groups are combined, okay? Uh, so that is Simpson's paradox. Nothing wrong with the data, but this is what is going on. Okay, so for the aggregated table, the one where you know shift two showed that we had a whole bunch of defectives, we didn't know anything about supplier. Shift is actually uh, linked to supplier, right? Because remember, one supplier was. Uh, the first supplier was more on the first shift and the second supplier is more on the second shift. So shift is related to supplier. And actually supplier is related to the number of defective. Okay? Looks like supplier two has some bad stuff, right? So supplier is related to the number of defective. But because we didn't have supplier in our table, it appears to us that shift and number of defective are in fact related, right? But they're only related through their mutual relationship between um, themselves and supplier, okay? So shift looks like it is uh, related to number defective only because shift is related to supplier and supplier is related to number defective, okay? So that's how that works. And so here we can see manifested, hold on a second, stuck again with my animation. Hold on. Sorry. Hold on again. There we go. Oop. 
for the aggregated table, we saw that shift looked like it was linked to percent effective, but that's only through the supplier. And we call supplier, in this case, a lurking variable because it's, it's related to both of things, but we just don't know about it. Okay? All right, now, once we split things up, once we were able to account for supplier in those two other tables, right? now shift doesn't give us any information about the number of defectives. So we just have directly from supplier to number defective, and shift doesn't give us any information about uh, the number of defectives anymore. Okay? This is where we call uh, shift is conditionally independent of defectives. Once we know supplier, and the condition is once we know supplier, now shift doesn't help us figure out the number of defectives. Okay? And so we see that manifested here and for material supplier one, percent effective doesn't change over shift, right? And that's because it's all being led off of the supplier one. And then here in the second uh, table for supplier two, we see that there's no difference between shifts and defectives either because really the, the thing that's driving it is that supplier two had some faulty material, and that's what caused the defects. But you would never know that if you had just looked at that summary table. Kind of interesting. So how would we mitigate the paradox? You know, a rule of thumb is you know, analyze your data in granular form. So we want to stay away from aggregated tables, because what happens then is we could have a lot of lurking variables in there, and what we think is a cause isn't necessarily a cause. right? To get rid of any sort of confounding, you can go ahead and design an experiment. Um, but what we had here was we had historical data um, in, a, in a table, so it wasn't from a designed experiment. But if you go, can go ahead and design a, a factorial, fractional factorial experiment, it takes care of this confounding problem. And another thing you can do uh, is to perform a Cochrane mantle hansel test. Okay? And what that does, it, it's a hypothesis test for association between two variables while accounting for a third variable. Okay? So we would be accounting for, um, say, supplier, and then it would show up that, oh, well, then shift and number of defective don't have anything to do with each other. It would kind of tell us that. And that statistic, the Cochrane mantle hansel statistic, follows a chi-square distribution with just one degree of freedom. Okay? So that is how we can do that. All right. Uh, so I appreciate your, your attention. We've got, uh, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. If anybody wants to go ahead and send me an invite, I'd be happy to accept. Uh, I've got a blog on quality and applied statistics that you can link there. And I've got my email and the website is sigma.university. So thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, we're going to go ahead and unmute all the lines and open it up for questions. Okay. Pull down now. So does anybody have any questions for Mary? How do you find those hidden variables? That's a very good question. If they're, if they're hidden, um, you wouldn't necessarily find them. Um, we were lucky because we, we split our, our aggregated table on that link, that lurking variable that happened to be material supplier. But if we had to split it between uh, machine one and machine two, we still wouldn't have found it. So, uh, you know, that was just by luck that we, we found what the true cause is. That's why when you're looking at happenstance data, um, you know, sometimes you, you can't find the true cause, which is why design of experiments is so great, right? So, uh, yeah, try to look at things uh, sliced a whole bunch of different ways, and that way you can try to pick up what these lurking variables are. That's a very good question. Yeah, even when your data appears to be well-behaved, right, uh, sometimes you won't know that there's a lurking variable there. Very true. Trying to think and looking. All right. Anybody have any other questions, 
comments? All right, great, thank you. Mary, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very informative. Yeah, sorry for the glitches, but... Uh... <laughs> That's the, it's the content that matters. All right, thank you. <laughs> So uh, with that, uh, I guess we're going to conclude the presentation. We do thank everybody for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, please do be looking out for the supplier survey. Uh, we will be sending that in the next uh, few days. Um, and uh, uh, check out our website for future events. And we look forward to seeing you all again.